Cairo, Egypt, December 1181. It has been two years since the Battle of Jacob's Ford. Salah ad-Din's series of victories forced the Crusaders to offer peace. Since then, it has been a period of relative calmness. Respecting the truce, Salah ad-Din did not make a move against the Crusaders. He used his time to focus on administration of his vast territories and gathering strength for his future expeditions. He founded many hospitals, madrasas, and agricultural infrastructures. Egypt was booming in wealth. Fortifications along the Egyptian borders had been upgraded. The naval fleet was also strengthened and guarded the coastlines day and night. The advantage of increasing security was twofold, preventing future raids by the Crusaders in Egypt as well as a secure fallback position for the Muslim army if they are forced to retreat in future battles. However, Syria could not be made as secure as Egypt, as Salah ad-Din had to depend on a network of uneasy and complicated treaties and alliances to maintain his power in Syria. Salah ad-Din had to make sure that he had complete and absolute hold in Syria before he attempted to take Jerusalem again. He didn't want to leave untrustworthy political alliances behind his back as he moved against the Crusaders. Here, we see again how Salah ad-Din learned from his mistakes during the Battle of Montgazar, leaving no point of weakness behind the frontiers. Salah ad-Din's court in Cairo. As Salah ad-Din was discussing stately matters with his emirs, a messenger arrived. News from Syria. Prince as Salih had passed away in Aleppo. The de facto Zengid leader Saif ad-Din also passed away several months ago. This vacuum in leadership created squabbles in the Zengid clan. This was high time for Salah ad-Din to increase his influence in Syria. 7th May, 1182. Salah ad-Din left Cairo with an army of 8,500 soldiers after a great ceremony. This was the last time Salah ad-Din was on Egyptian land. The springboard from which he launched his political career and emerged as a figure of power, Salah ad-Din would go on to live more than a decade after this and he would continue to rely on the resources of Egypt for his actions in the future. This proved how well he arranged the administration of Egypt as well as this, his ultimate goal and priorities laid in Syria and in the Holy Lands. As soon as Salah ad-Din reached Syria, news came of a raid conducted by Reynald of Chatillon in the borders. So in July 1182, Salah ad-Din sent troops to punish Reynald. The two armies met near the Sea of Galilee, also known as Lake Tiberias. The crusade force of around 700 men was decimated by a larger Muslim force. The heat was so strong that many men died of even heat stroke. This was the first of the three battles in the area over the next six years between the Muslims and the Crusaders, giving Salah ad-Din plenty of opportunity to learn about the local landscape and the weakness in the battle strategy of the Crusaders. Meanwhile, Salah ad-Din continued with his mission towards Aleppo. As he moved on, Many emirs previously supportive of the Zengid dynasty switched their allegiance and came to Salah ad-Din's side. Realizing Salah ad-Din's stronger position, Haran, Edessa, and Raqqa, and many other regions came under Salah ad-Din's control. But when Salah ad-Din reached Aleppo, he chose not to lay siege on the city, rather moved his army further east towards Mosul. Salah ad-Din's army marched through the arid land of Mesopotamia for 600 kilometers to the heartland of Zengid dynasty. The new Zengid leader, Imad ad-Din, was based in Mosul. But upon reaching Mosul, Salah ad-Din realized that it was not possible for him to take Mosul. After a long march, his army was exhausted, and Mosul was heavily defended 
the siege would be long and the damage on Salahuddin's army would be heavy. Salahuddin had to come up with another plan, and Salahuddin always come up with his brilliant plans. In a clever move, he took two formidable nearby fortresses named Sinjar and Amid. So Mosul was isolated from the rest of the Zangid lands, and this weakened Imad al-Din's position significantly. Salah al-Din achieved the upper hand, and now he could force Imad al-Din to negotiate for truce. Imad al-Din had no other option but to accept Salah al-Din's offer. Salah al-Din would return the captured fortresses in exchange for control of Aleppo. June 20, Salah al-Din's yellow banners were raised over the citadel of Aleppo as he entered the city. Years of effort to bring Aleppo under command had finally been realized. The second strongest city of Syria after Damascus consolidated Salah al-Din's rule over Syria even further. The Crusaders were now afraid Salah al-Din had become even a greater threat for them after the capture of Aleppo. The most powerful Crusader state, the Kingdom of Jerusalem, was now completely surrounded by Salah al-Din's territory. In a desperate attempt to deliver a serious blow to Salah al-Din's reign, Reynald of Châtillon devised a devilish plan to snatch the body of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, from his tomb in Medina. Red Sea A ship carrying Muslim pilgrims were heading towards port of Rabi'ah near Medina. As the captain of the pilgrim ship looked at the horizon, he saw something strange. Six ships were approaching fast. As they drew nearer, the flags hoisted on the ships became clearly visible. Crusader banners. Panic ensued. Volleys of arrows came flying onto the pilgrims. They screamed with fear of their lives. Some even jumped out of the ship to save their lives. The crusaders mounted the pilgrim ship. The slaughter started. No one was left alive on board. Disappearances of such pilgrim ships became frequent. How could this happen? The crusaders had no direct access to the Red Sea. But this proved a little obstacle for Reynald's treachery. He ordered his engineers to make small ships in parts. The parts were carried through the Sinai Peninsula on top of the camels in secret missions to reach the Red Sea. There, the parts were assembled and now Crusader ships were in the Red Sea. The arrival of such an unexpected threat wreaked panic in the whole region. As soon as the news reached Cairo, fleets were sent to destroy the Crusader ships. Meanwhile, the Crusaders continued with their mission and disembarked near Rabir. From there, they continued inland towards Medina. The Muslim troops tracked them down and chased them through the desert. Finally, after a fierce fight, the Crusaders surrendered. They were 170 in number. This unprecedented wickedness by the Crusaders in the heart of Islam was arranged to challenge Salah al-Din's position as the hero of the Muslims. Although unsuccessful, it proved how desperate the Crusaders became to stop Salah al-Din at any cost. Salah al-Din could not let such provocation go without a strong response. He moved his forces to Karak. Hearing this news, King Baldwin IV, although in a very terminal condition, started marching towards Karak with a huge army. They offered truce to Salah al-Din. Salah al-Din did not want to be trapped outside the castle of Karak. So he agreed to keep the peace and return back to Syria. But as times passed by, the raids on the pilgrim caravans continued. And the mastermind behind the threat was no other than Reynald of Châtillon. His fort, Karak, was conveniently located near the caravan route from Syria to Mecca. Salah al-Din sent troops again and again to take the castle, but each time they were unsuccessful by the arrival of Crusader relief forces from Jerusalem. 
although the stalemate continued on the Western Front until 1186. Several important events changed the power dynamics. In 1185, King Baldwin IV died, and the thrones passed to his seven-year-old nephew, Baldwin V. This weak position of the Crusaders forced them to continue negotiating peace with Salah din In the meantime, Salah din had to move his focus away from the western border to the eastern border of his territories. News of military activity near Mosul arrived in Damascus. The army of Seljuk Turks have made a move to occupy the city. Salahuddin could not let another power struggle to delay his mission. So he marched towards Mosul and placed an encirclement before the Seljuk army arrived. A long negotiation started and after five months of discussion, the Zengids swore obedience under Salahuddin's rule and promised to supply soldiers and resources to Salahuddin's mission in the Holy Lands. With that, any remaining Zengid power in Syria vanished and Salahuddin had the whole greater Mesopotamia under his control. As these events were taking place in Mosul, Baldwin V died in summer 1186 and his reign passed down to Guy of Lusignan. He was the second husband of the mother of Baldwin V. As soon as Guy came into power, Reynald of Châtillon broke the truce and attacked a Muslim caravan moving from Cairo to Damascus. Some Western sources say Salah din's sister was in this caravan. This adds a deep personal connection to Salah din but the Muslim sources mention no such information. If she would be truly in the caravan, the level of outrage by Salah din and his emirs would have been much greater. So we can safely say that Salah din's sister was not in the caravan. However, this provocation surely enraged Salah din Salah din demanded the release of all the prisoners, full compensation for the raid and apology from Reynal. But Reynald refused. This broke Salah din's patience. Salah din now had absolute control of all the lands of Greater Egypt, Syria, Arabia, and Yemen. So there was nothing this time holding him back. Salah din summoned all the emirs and all the allies for their support in his mission to retake the Holy Lands from the Crusaders. This time he would not only punish Reynald, but also fulfill his lifelong dream, freeing Jerusalem from the Crusaders as planned. The Muslim army took their first steps in the Kingdom of Jerusalem in April of 1187. 1187, Jerusalem. An army of 20,000 came out of the city marching. Leading the army was Guy of Louisignan. Behind him were 1,200 knights in their shiny armors. Several thousand Turkopoles. Several thousand men-at-arms armed to the teeth. The rest of the procession was infantry. The army marched with the greatest talisman of Christianity, the True Cross. They believed whenever the True Cross marched with the Christian army, that army would never be beaten in a battle. Only after a few days, this whole army would cease to exist at the Battle of Hattin. Rewinding a few weeks, April 1187, the Muslim army had just started to gather at the border of Kingdom of Jerusalem. The general order for the Christian troops was not to engage the Muslims yet. On one evening, as a group of Muslim soldiers were returning to their camp after foraging, suddenly the captain saw movements on top of a nearby hill. He tried to figure out what was happening there, but as soon as he saw the banners of the groups, his heart froze. The men on the hilltop were Knights Templar and Knights Hospitaller. Warrior monks sworn to defend Christianity, the most elite and strongest groups of the Crusader army. As the Muslims came close to their camp, 
a wave of crusader knights started to come down to the Muslim camp from the hilltop. The Muslim soldiers screamed in fear. Some started to gather their weapons, and some froze with panic. The knights were around 140 in number. The grand masters of both the Templar and Hospitaller Knights Order were leading the group. However, Muslims were around 5,000 to 6,000 in number at the camp. So as soon as they realized the reality, the surprise attack lost its effectiveness. The Muslims fought back fiercely. This charge proved to be very devastating for the Crusaders and very rewarding for the Muslims. All the knights fell in the battlefield, except only four. No doubt the knights were brave, but they were no match for the Muslims. The Grand Master of Knights Hospitaller was killed, and the Grand Master of Knights Templar fled after being wounded. After this victory, the Muslims started marching even deeper into the Kingdom of Jerusalem. Panic ensued throughout all the Crusader states. They united all their forces. Every man able to bear arms was conscripted in the army. All the princes of the Crusader states, including Reynald of Châtillon, Raymond of Tripoli, and Balian Ibelin, joined the army. King Guy advanced with all the forces that he could muster to meet the Muslims, which we saw at the beginning of this video. June 1187, Jordan River Valley, the Ayyubid Yellow Banners covered the whole valley as Salah Din marched with 30,000 troops towards the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. The recent victory at Crescent and the campaigns in 1182 and 1183 made his army familiar with the battle tactics of the Crusaders in that area. The Christians have camped near the springs of Safuria around 30 kilometers far from Salahuddin's current position. Between the two armies was an arid land with no water and food sources. Salahuddin's plan was to provoke the crusaders to make the march through the inhospitable terrain. Accordingly, Salahuddin laid siege to a small town called Tiberias on the western shore of Sea of Galilee, or Lake Tiberias. With the ending of the Battle of Hattin, the whole Crusader army ceased to exist. King Guy was arrested with all the surviving Crusader princes. The True Cross also came to the Muslim hands. The most important prisoners were presented before Salahuddin. Salahuddin offered a cup of iced julep to Guy, who took a big gulp from it. Then he passed it to Reynald of Châtillon. Salahuddin intervened in a flash. Through his interpreter, he told Guy, You are the one who gave him a drink. I gave him no drink, nor any of my food. According to Islamic tradition, offering a drink or food to a prisoner represents offering safety by the captor. But Salahuddin did not want to offer such protection to Reynald. Salahuddin berated Reynald for his constant insult and threat towards the Muslims. Seeing no remorse in Reynolds' face, Salahuddin unsheathed his scimitar and slashed Reynolds' neck, exacting the full revenge of the Muslims. With Guy under arrest and his army completely wiped out, the whole Kingdom of Jerusalem had no more resistance to offer against Salahuddin. It was time for Salahuddin to knock on the gate of Jerusalem. As Salahuddin progressed with his army towards his primal goal, Jerusalem, he did not make any strategic mistakes as he did 10 years ago, which resulted in the defeat at Mont Gazart. This time, Salahuddin sent troops to occupy all the remaining Crusader strongholds and ports. Acre, Sidon, Beirut, Jaffa, Mirabel, Ascalon, all fell one after another in front of Salahuddin's troops. Salahuddin showed mercy to the defenders and granted them generous terms for surrender. This ensured swift and near bloodless submission of the cities. By the time Salahuddin reached Jerusalem, only Karak and Tyre were still resisting against Salahuddin's troops. Salahuddin could not sidetrack his army to capture these sites, 
as that would mean delay in the liberation of Jerusalem. This was a well-thought decision based on the current situation, but would turn into a strategic mistake by Salahuddin. As Tyre would be the arrival point of the Western forces during the Third Crusade. 20th of September, 1187. Salahuddin climbed up a small hill nearby his camp. He could see the Dome of Rock glistering with golden rays under the sun beyond the wall of Jerusalem. A little behind the Dome of Rock stood the Al-Aqsa Mosque, two sacred buildings he so desired, his lifelong dream, his ultimate goal. When the Crusaders took Jerusalem from the Muslims in 1099, during the First Crusade, they killed all the non-Christian inhabitants of the city, which created a knee-deep blood pool at the Al-Aqsa complex. The inhabitants of Jerusalem feared that the Muslims would take revenge in a similar manner once they retake the city, so they prepared to defend Jerusalem at all cost. Both the Christians and the Muslims venerate the city as a holy place, so it was a religious and moral obligation for both sides to prevail. Looking at the third holy city in Islam, Salah ad knew that it would not be an easy task to take the city back. Yet he commanded his troops to move forward, and the siege of Jerusalem began. The Muslims initiated the attack with volleys of arrows targeting the defenders from the wall. Salah ad encircled the city with his army and assessed the fortifications to find a weak point. After five days of assessment, Salah ad focused his attack on the less protected section of the wall between Damascus Gate and Jehoshaphat Gate. The continuous bombardment of the trebuchet started. The Christians realized that the fight was over. They offered to stand down if Salah ad would promise the safety of its inhabitants. Salah ad had no desire to destroy the city itself to ashes in the process of taking it nor did he want an unnecessary bloodbath at the holy city. His main goal was to retake the holy city under Muslim custody, and not to take cruel revenge for what the crusaders did 88 years ago. So Salah ad showed mercy and offered generous terms for the surrender of the city. In exchange, 10 dinar for each man, 5 dinar for each woman, and 1 dinar for each child. Salah ad promised to let the Christian inhabitants of Jerusalem free. They were also allowed to take as much as they could carry when they left the city. A very generous offer, considering other contemporary terms for surrender in that era. And it didn't discriminate between rich and poor. Everyone had to pay the same amount. Finally, on Friday, October 2nd, in the year of 1187, the city of Jerusalem was surrendered to the Muslims. What an auspicious day it must have been for the Muslims, as they gathered at the Al-Aqsa Mosque for their Friday prayer after 88 years. In those 88 years, the mosque was used by the Knights Templars as their headquarters, and any Muslim prayer was prohibited. Finally, the mosque returned to its former glory, as the Christians gradually started to leave Jerusalem to other regions still under Crusader control, such as Tyre. Salah ad put work in re-establishing the Islamic features of the city. The Ayyubid's banners were flown on top of the towers in the citadel. The mosques were cleaned and made operational. New madrasas were opened. Islamic scholars were brought back to the city. Regular adans and prayers were started to be performed. Yet Salah ad did not raise a finger on the Church of Holy Sepulchre, the holiest site for Christianity. He kept the promise of the second Caliph of Islam, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, who promised to the Christians to protect the site when the Muslims took Jerusalem in 638. Salah ad brought a member from Aleppo made by Nur ad with the wish to place it one day in the Al-Aqsa Mosque and thereby showed respect to the legacy of Nuruddin Zindi. The liberation of Jerusalem from the Crusaders was one of the most symbolic moments in human history. Salah ad legacy during the liberation of Jerusalem has echoed down the history.
The stark contrast between how the Crusaders behaved in 1099 and how Salah al-Din behaved in 1187 stand as a testimony of his generosity and tolerance. When all the great celebrations were taking place throughout the Islamic lands for the liberation of Jerusalem, back in Vatican, Pope Gregory VIII was infuriated by the loss of Jerusalem from the Christians. He sent letters to all the lords and kings of Europe, urging them to start a holy war to recapture Jerusalem. Thus began one of the greatest saga of all time, the Third Crusade.